It's good to be with you. Glad that you can watch from wherever you are watching. I imagine that most of you have not heard or seen me preach before. If you have, you may be used to seeing me with dark black glasses. Uh, This is not a new fashion statement. I was just so tired of wearing the mask and having my glasses fogged up that I'm wearing contacts now. So you can see me. I can't see you, but glad that you are here. Our text for this afternoon comes from Matthew chapter six, the second and third petitions in the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For the past few months, I've been making my way through Andrew Roberts' 1100 page biography of Winston Churchill. It's an amazing book about an amazing life And one of the themes running throughout the book is Churchill's lifelong belief in the goodness and the greatness of the British Empire. Now, Roberts, the author, remarks that today we think differently of imperialism and colonialism and acknowledge that with good things, there were also many evils that they perpetrated. But Churchill did not see things that way. When he experienced for the first time as a young man stationed with the military in India and saw British rule there, to his mind, he saw great advances and he admired the railways, the irrigation projects, the education, the newspapers, the bridges, the roads, the aqueducts, the universities, the hospitals, the rule of law, the military protection afforded by British army and navy, the benefits of the English language, the abolition of some traditional practices like the burning of widows on funeral pyres. For Churchill, all of this was confirmation in his mind of what he had been brought up hearing and believing as an English aristocrat, namely, that Britain was worth living and dying for. Now, I'm not interested here in the historical debate about the blessings and curses of British rule in India. I'm sure we have some people in India, and they would be much more informed than I would be and could talk about it. What I want us to notice is what Robert says about the commitments Churchill embraced as a young man in his early 20s, the age of many of you who are watching this. Roberts writes this, Churchill took the firm and irrevocable decision to dedicate his life to the defense of the British Empire against all its enemies at home and abroad. Time and again throughout his political career, he would put his allegiance to his ideal of the empire before his own best interests. Now, if Winston Churchill and so many other men and women like him of that age could make that sort of commitment to the British Empire with all of its imperfections, how much more should we as Christians be committed to a vastly more gracious, more significant, more eternal kingdom? What if it was said about you in your late teens, in your early 20s, that you took the firm and irrevocable decision to dedicate your life to the proclamation of the kingdom of God against all its enemies at home and abroad? Or what if someone said about your life many years later, looking back, that time and again, you put your allegiance to God and his will before your own best interests. In parentheses, John Piper would want me to inform you that actually God's glory and your own best interests and joy converge. Now, we are going to look in this message at the second and third petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Very clear organization for you if you want to take some notes. If not, that's fine. But there will be three questions that I want us to look at. First, and this will be by far the longest point, and this is where we will do most of the heavy lifting, what is meant by God's kingdom and God's will in this prayer? That's the first question. Second, 
what are we asking for when we make these two petitions? And third, how should we live in light of these requests? So here's the first question, and just don't panic that this is going to take most of our time, and we will plan accordingly with the second and third question. What is meant by God's kingdom and by God's will in this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray? And we're going to start with the word kingdom. This is where we'll spend most of our time. The Greek word for kingdom, basileia, occurs 162 times in the New Testament. So that tells you something of its importance as a biblical word and theme. Although the Lord's Prayer just uses the word kingdom, it's obviously a reference to God's kingdom. We've prayed, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we're speaking about God's kingdom, our Father's kingdom. And most often in the Gospels, it's referred to as the kingdom of God. Or you may know that in Matthew's Gospel, it's often the kingdom of heaven. It's the same thing. That's simply a Jewish way of speaking of the God who is in heaven, his kingdom. You could define kingdom in its simplest terms as God's reign and his rule. His reign and his rule. But think about what this prayer has us request, as it is in heaven. So this is one way to to get at what the kingdom is about. The kingdom is God's redemptive presence coming down from heaven to earth. We can trace this theme throughout the Bible. So just think, God's presence, and by that I mean his holiness, his covenant relationship with his people was there with Adam and Eve in the garden and then because of sin and rebellion, they are kicked out of the garden. But that's not the end of the story. God promises a holy land and we don't have time to look at it, but the way the land is described and the boundaries and it's a kind of Eden. It's going to be a new sort of garden in which the presence of God dwells. That's why in the midst of the camp, there is the tabernacle, and later when they're a permanent people, they have a temple representative of the fullness of God's presence as he dwells there with his covenant people. But just like in the garden, eventually because of sin and rebellion, God's people are what? They are kicked out of this new garden, out of this Canaan, this promised land, and they are exiled east of Eden, east to Babylon. Now, over time, they're allowed to return to Canaan. They build a new temple, but yet they're not fully constituted in a way. They still don't have complete control over themselves by the time of the New Testament. They still have, they're really a vassal state of the Roman Empire. And when Jesus comes, he announces that he will be the new temple. And he will now be the center point of true religion. So no longer will God's presence on earth be situated in a specific land or around a building or a tent, but around a person, which means that now the redemptive presence of God is experienced and known where Jesus is believed upon and followed and known, which means that though they are not identical, there is a very close relationship between the kingdom and the church because it's in the church now where the heavenly realities of love and forgiveness and salvation are experienced. And think about it. There's a connection with Eden, with Canaan, because now if your life is marked by sin and rebellion, well, you're not kicked out of Eden, kicked out of Canaan, but you're kicked out of the church, church discipline, excommunication. Those passages that referred to being put outside the camp in the Old Testament are now applied in the New Testament to refer to church discipline because the church is the new sort of promised land, the new sort of Eden, the new sort of outpost of heavenly realities here on earth. Now that's not the end of the story because life in the church, as we know, is imperfect and it's looking forward to eternal life where finally God's redemptive presence will be enjoyed to the fullest. In the age to come, the kingdom will no longer be something that is 
broken in here or there, but it will be all in all. This is the good news of Revelation 11.5. Maybe you've heard this verse before, or maybe some of you have listened to Handel's Messiah or sung it before in this Christmas season. And there's a line there from Revelation 11. The kingdom of the world. Now, if you've ever sung it, usually the conductor will have, you get very soft. I won't sing it for you here, but the kingdom of this world, and you get really hushed, is become, and there's just a slight pause, and then you come in loud, is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Trust me, there's multitudes of a dozen people here singing with me. That is the moment to come when the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth become one. That's what we're anticipating. But for now, it is that heavenly reality, the redemptive presence of God breaking into our world. One author says it this way, the kingdom reveals the ultimate meaning of history. Now, from this brief sweep of redemptive history, we can see the kingdom is both present and future. That is, in one sense, Jesus is already king. He's not awaiting any election results. And in another sense, he must become king. The kingdom of God can refer to the age that is to come. Let me just give you a few verses so you don't think I'm making this up. Matthew 25, 31 through 34. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So clearly there, the kingdom is something that is future. Similarly, in Matthew 13, Jesus says, the son of man will send his angels to gather out of the world, out of the kingdom, all causes of sin and lawbreakers, throw them into the fiery furnace, and then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So these passages, Matthew 25, Matthew 13, are looking forward to that great, day of judgment and sorting when the kingdom will have fully arrived. This is why Jesus in John 18, 36 says, my kingdom is not of this world, meaning he did not come to rule from an earthly throne. His kingdom has yet to be fully established. So clearly the kingdom is something that is future. It is yet to come and yet the kingdom is in another sense already arrived. It's coming and it has come. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus says, if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus cast out demons and it was one indication that the kingdom had already come. It was there. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus tells the Pharisees, they're looking for the kingdom in all the wrong places. They're expecting an observable king like they would have in their region as they experienced in the past with the great kings of David or Solomon. But the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is already in the midst of you. That's a key text because Jesus is saying, look, you want someone in a palace, you want someone on a throne, but I'm telling you, the kingdom is present right here in your midst. Now, now why can he say that? Because he is there. He is making an audacious statement about himself that where Jesus is present, there the kingdom has come. Colossians 1.13 says, believers have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved son. So all of these, and there's many more, indicate that the kingdom in one sense is coming and in another sense it has already come its present and future. It is like the sun, S-U-N, in the sky breaking through the clouds. But the rain has not fully passed. The brightness of the sun is not yet experienced as it will be. 
There's still clouds there, but you can feel some of its rays. In, in a technical sense, the kingdom doesn't grow. Now, there are a number of parables that speak of the growth of the kingdom as it appears to us, and people can come in, and the number of those who belong to the kingdom can grow. But the kingdom, as God's sovereign sway or rule, it is what it is. And it is like the sun. The sun doesn't grow. Now, somebody's going to say, now, hold on a second, there's solar flares, and it's expanding at a rate. Okay, well, but for the most of us who just look at it, it doesn't grow. It's there, but you can feel the sun's warmth, you can feel its rays, you can feel the effects of the sun. You're not making the sun what it is, but it can come through, it can shine more clearly, more brightly, more warmly. All of that is true of the kingdom. At the end of the age, it will be unbelievably grand and glorious. Now I'm belaboring this point about the kingdom because it is one of those areas where well-meaning Christians can get their theology sideways. And we need to be on guard against certain misunderstandings about the kingdom of God. Think for a moment, maybe some of you know this and others hearing it for the first time, that's fine. Acts chapter one, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. The disciples are gathered together and they ask one final question of Jesus. Acts 1, 6, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, they've been with him three years. They've seen amazing things, but they're still misunderstanding the nature of the kingdom. They say there are no bad questions, but this one, yeah, it comes close. They show they don't understand yet the kingdom. They misunderstand the timing of the kingdom. They're thinking at this time, right now, when the kingdom is both present and future, Jesus will say, I'm going to heaven in the same way I go up, I will come again at the end of the age. So there's an interim here between the kingdom coming and the kingdom being fully established. They misunderstand the timing. They misunderstand the domain of the kingdom. Notice their question is, is now the time where you will restore the kingdom for Israel? They're thinking of another national kingdom like they enjoyed in the good old days with David and Solomon. Jesus is talking about a universal kingdom where membership is not by ethnic heritage or by geography. You enter by faith and repentance. So Jesus corrects their thinking in Acts 1.8, in effect saying, it's, it's too small a thing for me to restore the earthly kingdom to Israel. You're thinking too small. No, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They most fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the kingdom. They are still thinking, and we can understand why they would, of an earthly and political kingdom when Jesus is speaking of a spiritual and heavenly kingdom. All throughout the Gospels, we see people expecting Jesus to marshal an army and throw off the Romans and establish a literal throne. Now, if you were to go out into the world, as the apostles did, and to preach the good news of the kingdom among Gentiles in places like Ephesus or Rome, what sort of good news would it really be to tell Gentiles in Rome that there's going to be a new Jewish kingdom and Jesus is going to set up a throne in Jerusalem. That wouldn't make sense. That's not the sort of kingdom that he envisions. We see throughout the gospels, people misunderstand this. Matthew eleven twelve: 12, the violent try to take the kingdom of heaven by force. That's what they're thinking the kingdom is. It is a military coup. But Jesus says, John 3, 3, no one can see the kingdom unless he is born again. That's how the kingdom comes. We cannot bring about the kingdom by elections or education or humanitarian good works or by environmental stewardship or by the cultivation of the arts. Listen very carefully. We must not be confused on this point. For sure, kingdom values should infiltrate our politics. Kingdom living should make a difference in our communities. But the kingdom does not advance when trees are planted 
or when unemployment is lowered, or even merely when injustices are addressed. Those may be good things, and especially the cause of justice is near to the heart of God. They may reflect the priorities of the kingdom, but the kingdom comes when and where the king is known. Go back to the earlier explanation of the sweep of redemptive history in the relationship between the church and the kingdom. The church is like an outpost or an embassy of the kingdom. Think of you have an embassy in a country, maybe you have an American embassy in, in France, and, and what does that American embassy do there? Well, it wants to be a good, uh, have a good relationship with the country in which it's living, but ultimately that embassy is there to further the cause of a distant country. It's an outpost of America. And when you're there, there's certain rules that operate as Americans would operate. And it's there for the interest of those who have another home somewhere else. And so it is with the church as an outpost of the kingdom. Think about all the things that Jesus has us pray in the Lord's Prayer as as John said last night, all of them go together. Where is it that the Father's name is hallowed? Where is it that our our debts are forgiven? Where is it that the will of God is done? It is in the church. We have this dual citizenship. Yes, we belong to this world in whatever country we are a part of, but more importantly, we belong to the kingdom. And the church is that embassy or that outpost, that Heavenly reality broken in here on earth. So the kingdom of God is his reign and rule. It is present and future. It's already here. It's not yet fully arrived. And it is the inbreaking of heaven here on earth where the king is known and believed upon. Now much more quickly, we need to understand what Jesus means by the will of God. Now, don't panic. I told you that this first question was going to be the long one. So, the will of God. There are two aspects to the will of God in Scripture. We can think of these as two sides of the same coin. We could call them God's will of decree and God's will of desire. God's will of decree refers to God's sovereign sway over all things. In this sense of will, everything that comes to pass is according to the will of God. Nothing that comes to pass does so except as it conforms to the will of God. In this ultimate sense, everything that comes to pass, now I'm not saying God is the author of sin, I'm not saying God is the one doing the action, but it is in accordance with his sovereign immutable will. Want some verses? Give you a couple, Matthew 10, 29 and 30. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, Jesus says, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. It's obviously referencing apart from his will. Apart from your father, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Or Ephesians 1, 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works, listen, all things, according to the counsel of his will. Not just big things, little things, all things according to the counsel of his will. So in this sense of the will of God, whatsoever comes to pass is the will of God. His will cannot be thwarted. It will happen because he is sovereign and he has decreed it. There is, however, another way in which this language is used. And if that's the will of decree, we might think of this other way as a will of desire. That is, what God commands of us, what he wants of us as his followers. Here's a couple of verses. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Think about it, Matthew 10 Jesus said, you can't have birds or hares fall to the ground apart from God's will. But here in Matthew 7, he says, 
you won't go into heaven except the one who does the will of my Father. So clearly, he's speaking about the will of God in two different senses. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world And the world is passing away along with its desires. And then listen to this, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So there, the will of God is put opposite worldliness, the lust of the eyes and the flesh and the desires that come from sinful motives. All of that is opposite. That's worldliness. Opposite that is the will of God. So we see in these verses that the will of God can be shorthand for obedience to God's commands. Doing the will of God means we say no to the desires of the flesh. So in one sense, we can submit to the will of God or not. The will of God in the second set of passages does not refer to God's ordination of all things, but to the way God commands us to live. And this is the will that we are praying about in the Lord's prayer because the difference between earth and heaven is not that God is sovereign over heaven, but he's not sovereign over earth. Do not think that. Do not think that, well, God's sovereign decree works in heaven, but he's just sort of rolling the dice and hoping things work out for the best here on earth. Absolutely not true. The prayer your will be done, is of this second kind, this will of desire or obedience to his commands. The difference is that every command in heaven is fulfilled with cheerful and full obedience, where that is not the case here on earth. And incidentally, small parentheses here, what we often mean and what you maybe, as you talk amongst yourselves, uh, you know, what, what, what's the will of God for my life? When you ask that question, you're probably thinking of, let's call it a will of direction, another kind of will of God. It's another topic not to be elaborated on now, except to say that there is no will of direction that God means for you to discover ahead of time. The last part of that sentence is important. Yes, God guides all your steps. He directs all our steps. And you may be able to look back and say, that's why I went to that school so I could meet her and get married. And that's why I tuned in to the cross conference and now I'm on the mission field five years later. All of that, yes, wonderfully true. And he may even surprise us with supernatural insights or leading that makes sense after the fact, but there's nowhere in the New Testament where we're commanded to seek out a mysterious will of direction whereby God, through writing in the sky or a fleece or a liver shiver, tells us what to do with every fork in the road. Here's what you major in, here's the job you take, here's who you marry, here's where you live. We're desperate for that sort of will of direction because we have so many choices in our life, But what scripture means by the will of God is either God's sovereign sway over all things, which cannot be thwarted, or God's commandments given to us that he wants us to follow. So 1 Thessalonians 4 says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's what God wants for you and I to be holy. So that's all the first question. Told you it would be the long one. Second question. What are we asking for when we make these two petitions? Well, that should be more obvious now that we understand what we mean by kingdom and will. When I was in college, I kept a prayer journal. And after my freshman year, I tallied up all the things I had prayed for, all the things I'd written down each day, a few things that I was praying for, to see what I was spending all of my time praying on. And there were three concerns that showed up over and over again in no particular order. One, uh, a family member who had been struggling and so was praying. Two, girls, because there was always some internal drama. I like to say there was lots of external drama, but I really wasn't 
dating anyone. It was internal drama in me. Is this going to work out and praying about things? Uh, and then third, running because I have not the body for football. I have the body for running away from people who want to hurt me. But I never was the runner that I wanted to be, but I was really intent on being so much better than I was. So I prayed for those things. Now, on the one hand, cast all your cares on the Lord. Those are not bad things to pray for. I wasn't praying for assassinations of world leaders or for a life of crime. I was casting all my cares on the Lord. But my prayers were not exactly centered on Jesus' priorities. I, I, I was not praying big kingdom focused God-centered prayers and, and even though the three things I was praying for were some level of good, some more than others, uh, I wasn't putting them through the grid that was for your glory, God, and for the sake of your kingdom and your will. Most of us, let's be honest, we, I'm, I'm speaking, assuming here for a moment, I'm speaking to Christians, I know that's not everyone watching, but most of us as Christians, we pray the same prayers that non-Christians pray. You don't have to be born again by the Spirit to want sick people to get better, to want to get married, to want to find a good job, to want to be healthy, to want to be safe. All fine things to desire. You don't need to be a Christian. Everyone virtually wants those things. What takes the work of the Spirit in your life is to pray this sort of prayer and mean it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's striking in Matthew 6 that Jesus does not tell the disciples how long to pray. We often get antsy about that. I wish I was praying more. Or what they should feel like when they pray. We get anxious about that too. Oh, I'm so distracted and I don't feel like that was very spiritual. What Jesus focuses on is what we should pray for. When we pray... Heavenly Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are asking God for the inbreaking of the messianic age. We are asking for his commandments to be obeyed promptly, gladly, and sincerely. We are asking for Christ to reign in human hearts. We are asking for the redemptive presence of God to be known and felt here and now. We are asking for the reign and rule of God and of heaven to be experienced on earth. We are asking for God's final victory to come. The Lord's prayer is in a way the cry of God's people saying, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. To pray this petition, D.A. Carson says, is quote, to ask that God's saving royal rule be extended now as people bow in submission to him and already taste the eschatological blessing of salvation and to cry for the consummation of the kingdom. And before we get to the, the last question, just notice something critically important in all this. In the New Testament, we see God's people praying for the kingdom proclaiming the kingdom. We never see them use the language of building the kingdom. Now, we've probably used that language before and don't want to be the language police, but I, I, I do want to be a little bit of the language police because this matters. Pay attention to the verbs associated with the kingdom. The kingdom can come, it can arrive, it can appear. But in the Gospels, we do not establish the kingdom, expand the kingdom, grow the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a society to be built. It is a gift to be received. It is God's kingdom. And so think of the verbs. You've maybe heard some of them in the passages we've read. The kingdom of God is what we receive we can receive it, we can seek it, we can enter it, we can inherit it, but we do not create it. We do not bring it or even, it's not said we give it to others. Only God can give the kingdom, Luke 12, 32. So in praying these petitions in the Lord's Prayer, we are not laying down a blueprint for cultural renewal or societal transformation as much as that may be an outworking of the proclamation. Rather, we are praying 
for a miracle of God's regenerating power and redemptive grace. Third, finally, how then should we live in light of these requests? Let me finish by giving you three words, obediently, outwardly, expectantly. So in light of these requests, we should live obediently. J.I. Packer remarks that this prayer orients us in a profound way because when we want God to do our will, that's called magic. When we submit to doing God's will, that's called true religion. And isn't that the truth? So many of us, we want, we want a God, we want some great superhero in the sky to do what we want, to come and do the amazing things that we want to be done. That's magic. Can we manipulate this deity to show up and do miracles and do the fancy things we want him to do? True faith and religion says, I exist to do your will, not you to do mine. And what do we see in the gospels? What does it look like when we do the will of God? It means becoming like a little child, Mark 10, or putting our opportunities to work, Matthew 25, or it means watching, Mark 13, repenting, Matthew 3, seeking to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew 5. Think about these first three petitions. They have to do with God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. May your work in me, O Lord, Come that I may glorify your name, submit to your reign, and follow your rule. And start with me. Again, Packer says, to pray thy kingdom come is searching and demanding, for one must be ready to add and start with me. Make me your fully obedient subject. So often, maybe even now, we listen to sermons for other people. Believe me, your parents have listened to sermons for you that they wanted you to listen to. They maybe send them to you. We listen to messages for other people. We, we pray prayers that we think are about other people. But if we're really meaning this prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, we must be thinking in our hearts, oh Lord, start with me. And, and especially if you're thinking about missions, look, to, to get on a plane and go somewhere, there is nothing magically sanctifying and edifying about sitting in the tube of a plane. If you think that you're going to be an immature, disobedient believer in one country, and then through the magic of air travel with all of its glamour and romance, you will land in another country, and now you will be a mature, obedient Christian. It doesn't work like that. We must pray for ourselves to be obedient. Start with me, God. Second word, outwardly. This is a missions conference, and we haven't, in this sermon, said all that much directly about missions. That's been intentional. I've wanted to make sure you understand kingdom and will, because then you see how mission has everything to do with this prayer. One Bible commentator says, what Judaism had believed would come all at once is split into two parts with a mission in between. They're expecting the kingdom to come, boom, it's there, it's over, it's great, and Jesus said, no, there's gonna be a present and a future. There's a kingdom is here and the kingdom is coming. There's an already and a not yet. And in between the inauguration and the consummation, there's a mission. We cannot bring the kingdom or build the kingdom, but we can, praise God, announce the kingdom. The very first thing Jesus says in Mark's gospel, it's the singular message of his entire public ministry. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The presence of the kingdom is marked by the advancement of the gospel. Jesus' mission was to save sinners. His method was proclamation. Now you say, now wait a second, but Jesus was always 
casting out demons and he was healing the sick. That's absolutely true. The, the three prongs of his ministry were, were proclamation, healing, casting out demons. You see him do that almost everywhere he goes. But note very carefully, there are priorities among those. Jesus says in Mark chapter one, when they want him to hang around in Capernaum to heal some more people, he says, I gotta go to the next town that I may preach for that is why I came out. That is, that is why I came out in public ministry. I did not come out in public ministry to, be, to do exorcism, to heal as much as he did so, moved by compassion and as a demonstration of his messianic identity. So mark this very well. There is not one example in the Gospels where Jesus goes into a town with the purpose of setting up a healing clinic or an exorcism shop. He never says, I gotta go to the next town because I gotta heal sick people. I gotta go to the next town so I can cast out demons. He goes town by town that he might proclaim and preach. And as he does so, moved by compassion, he heals, he casts out demons to demonstrate that the kingdom has come in his very presence. We see this confirmed, this same pattern in the book of Acts. Acts is... Seven times the kingdom is mentioned and it's bookended. It's there in chapter one and it's the very last verse in chapter 28. The spread of God's reign and rule does not come by armies or elections or by good deeds, but by the spirit of God working through the words of the apostles and their followers. And so some of you should be the answer to your own prayers. And some of you should be the answer to the prayers of many other people who are praying and have prayed for God's kingdom to come, for peoples who have yet to hear of Jesus to put faith in him and you will be the answer to their prayer. Just as we see Paul at the end of Acts pro proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The kingdom is entirely of God and from God. The harvest is in his hands, but he gives us seed to sow. So let us be outward and then finally, obediently, outwardly, expectantly. By that I mean we move forward in life as followers of Jesus, expecting that God will act. Expecting, not, not presumptuously, not foolishly, not naming and claiming, but expectant that God loves to hear our prayers. We believe the Lord's promises to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What? For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see that? Some empires are worth living and dying for. And if Churchill thought the British Empire was, how much more is this heavenly kingdom? We believe the Lord's promises. We believe what the Lord says about judgment. You know, in Acts 20, as Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders, and he says, I, I have washed my hands clean. I'm clean of the blood of all of you. It's a weird phrase. What he means is, I have warned you about the coming judgment of God. If he hadn't, the blood would be on his hands, meaning he would be guilty. But he said, I, I've told you, may it never be in my church, in your church, may it never be that someone in our congregation could stand before God someday and say, no one ever told me a judgment was coming. Believe that the Lord Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead expectantly. But, but, Here's the very final thought. Expectant also to believe that this God who will judge and is holy is an inviting God. Think of the images in the gospel. There's a feast to come. There is a banquet. There is a wedding celebration. And God loves to invite people to the party. The God of the universe is sending out invitations to the banquet, and you get to be a messenger. I get to be a messenger. I get to deliver the greatest invitation in the history of the world and trust that some, those appointed for eternal life, will be glad to receive the invitation. 
and some will be gathered around that banqueting table because we went, because we sent, and because we prayed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your word, and we pray that you would teach us from it. Change us, equip us, correct us, encourage us through this word. And we pray that when this conference is done in a matter of hours later tonight, that yet your spirit would continue to preach a better word than the ones preached from this pulpit. And you would do a mighty work through your word in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.